Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special webinar of the Jerusalem Press Club, JPC. I'm Uri Dromi, Director General of JPC, and this is really a special occasion because we have been following the pandemic since it's erupted here back in March. And being loyal to our motto, JPC, where journalists meet Israel, we have been interviewing experts who help the press process the Israeli coronavirus experience. But this is the first time we are bringing together experts from three countries to share experiences, insights, and lessons. We are privileged to host the Dr. Karin Tegmark Wiesel from Sweden, Professor Lothar Bieler from Germany, and Professor Nadav Davidovich from Israel. They will be uh, properly introduced in a moment by our host, Moa Vardi, Chief International Correspondent of the Israel Public Television, who has been doing a wonderful job in explaining to Israeli viewers the complexities of this pandemic. I'd like to thank the German Ambassador to Israel, Dr. Susanne Wassum Reiner, and her staff, and the Swedish Ambassador to Israel, Mr. Erik Ullenhoek, and his uh, staff for their invaluable support in putting this event together. I'd like to thank my colleague at JPC, Talia, Talia Dekel, Vice President for Press, and special thanks to Rachel Lexiel, Press Coordinator at JPC, who's been instrumental in initiating and facilitating this webinar. It is my honor and pleasure now to ask the German Ambassador to Israel, Dr. Susanne wassum Reiner, to say a few words. Madam Ambassador, please. Thank you very much. I don't want to steal time for this uh, important and timely meeting we are having uh, just to welcome all participants and uh, of course the distinguished speakers uh, of that event. Um, we are, have been cooperating Israel and Germany throughout all this pandemic. We are living in a kind of split uh, with split emotions at the moment. Uh, we are, both of our countries are living through a further lockdown, but there's also the light at the end of the tunnel that we can see with the vaccines on the market and the vaccination processes that started. I'm very grateful to you and the Jerusalem Press Office um, to have us chosen as a partner and to have uh, organized that event. And I just wanted to underline how uh, pleased and how proud I am to see Professor Vila the president of the Robert Koch Institute, the National Public Health Institute in Germany to be here. The Robert Koch Institute is, has been from the beginning of the crisis, the most important point of reference for the German government. It is the institution that uh, presents us the facts of the, of the crisis and helps us to prepare political decisions. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. And now it is my pleasure to ask the Swedish Ambassador to Israel, Mr. Erik Ullenhoek, to say a few words. Thank you so much, Toda. Uh, a year ago, I was sitting watching the news with my youngest daughter, and they closed down China. And she asked me, will they close down Sweden or Jordan, as we were living in at the time? And I said, probably it won't happen. That happened in China. China it doesn't, doesn't happen in other countries. I was wrong. Uh, we have been living with the pandemic now for a year. Uh, I think we all should be quite humble and try to learn from each other's both mistakes and, and, and good things we are doing. Uh, living in Israel for the moment is quite amazing to see the vaccination program ro being rolled out. I was there, would just like to take this opportunity to thank the Jerusalem Press Club, uh, my German uh, colleague Suzanne for organizing this together. Uh, I hope that I will be slightly a little bit smarter in one and a half hour than I'm now. That's my expectation of this uh, this webinar. Of, uh, of course, because we have brilliant panel, ma panelists, and I'm very happy that we have Karen Tegmark Wiesel with us from Sweden. She is one of the key persons in fighting the pandemic in Sweden, and very well known to Swedish people now because uh, people are as in many countries watching the press conferences and trying to learn and trying to follow the, the rules and regulations set out by the Swedish Public Health Agency where Karin Tegmark Wiesel is working. Thank you so much uh, and thank you for organizing this next time in real life, uh, but uh, Toda. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. 
We have more than uh, 70 journalists online from all around the world, and many more will watch it later when it's uploaded on YouTube. I encourage you all uh, to keep uh, tuning in to our events. And if uh, following this webinar, you have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. And now, it is my pleasure to turn it over to our moderator, Yoav Valdi. Moav, please. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Um, my name is Moab Valdi. I'm the chief international correspondent for the Israeli public broadcaster, both television, radio, and digital. And I'm host a daily news show uh, focused on foreign affairs. And you know, obviously, in the past uh, almost a year, um, us in the in the um, in the network and me especially, um, we dedicated a lot of time, energy, and effort to cover the, uh, the uh, coronavirus. Um, you know, in the past year, uh, the world had to deal with an event that it hasn't experienced uh, in the last uh, 100 years since the uh, um, Spanish flu, an outbreak of a global pandemic. And, and since it was kind of an uncharted waters, uh, we have witnesses different uh, approaches and strategies to combat the coronavirus pandemic in different places and countries around the world. So today we are very happy to have the opportunity to hear about these different experiences of dealing with the coronavirus from three different countries, Germany, Sweden, and Israel. And I'm sure the discussion we are going to have here, um, I mean, this is my hope and my goal, that the discussion here will enrich our perspective um, on the policy that has been taken around the world to combat the pandemic and will enhance our ability to better understand the challenges uh, which our societies and governments um, are facing, still facing by the coronavirus. And uh, for that purpose, we are very lucky to have a dream team of uh, three professionals who serve at very important roles in their countries regarding dealing um, with the pandemic. And I want to introduce them. From Sweden, Dr. Karin Tegmark Wiesel. Um, Dr. Wiesel, she is the head of the Swedish Public Health Agency's Department of Microbiology. And she is also a regular representative by the, of the authorities at the daily press conference. And she is a deputy head uh, epidemiologist uh, in Sweden. Um, from Germany, we have Professor Lothar Wieler. Uh, Professor Wieler is the president of the uh, Robert Koch Institute, the public health institute we all know from Germany. Um, the institute is um, continuously monitoring the COVID-19 situation, evaluating all av available information and estimating the risk uh, for the population in Germany and providing health professionals with recommendation. Um, we are very, very honored uh, to have you here, Professor. And um, from mm -hmm. Israel, a person I know personally um, due to the coronavirus, and I had the pleasure to host him in my studio several times, Professor, professor Nadav Davidovich. Uh, Nadav, uh, Professor Davidovich is the director of the Ben Gurion University of the Negev School of Public Health. And he is also a member of the expert committee handling the corona crisis. And uh, on top of that, he is the Israeli official representative in the Executive Committee at the European Public Health Association. Um, thank you all for being with us. We are very honored to uh, have you on um, in this uh, panel. Um, we will go by three rounds of questions, um, kind of the same question for each and every um, professional that we have here. And then we will open the discussion for uh, questions from the audience, from the public um, here in the webinar. Um, I want to start with, the, uh, with you, um, Dr. Uh, Tegmark Wiesel from uh, Sweden. And in terms of strategy uh, that countries uh, have deployed to combat the pandemic, Sweden was kind of an exception. You did not impose lockdowns throughout the uh, corona outbreak, um, at least not in the way it was um, deployed or imposed in other countries. And I wish you to ask you to expand a little bit about this strategy and to ask you whether today, in retrospect, 
you believe this was the right strategy uh, to embrace. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for inviting me and the Public Health Agency to participate in this seminar. Yes, um, of course, there are many ways of uh, combating this pandemic and uh, different countries have their various um, underlying structures that enable us to perform things in different ways. But I would just like to start out with uh, the early phase of the pandemic. Uh, Sweden was like, I assume all countries in the world and especially in Europe, um, very well prepared with diagnostics and uh, a strategy to um, have a full focus on um, containment of the pandemic. But we were then in a situation in uh, March where we were faced with a situation where we had focused on testing uh, travelers from China, from Italy and um, Iran and Korea with, with a very strong focus on travelers from the regions in the world where the WHO had pointed out that there were ongoing transmission. In March, when we were starting to have the first cases that we then identified through our quite uh, large scale testing that was in place at that time, we were then struck um, very hard by an ongoing community transmission that had occurred not through the import from the countries I just mentioned, but from other uh, sources and other places in the world. So we were in the beginning of April, end of March, uh, focusing a large scale ongoing community transmission. At that phase, we did not, and it was also a period of the year where we have a large amount of common colds. Uh, we have a very large travel um, in the population. So we have about 1 million people traveling during the month of end of February, beginning of first part of March. Moreover, a large part of the population have common symptoms as of the common cold. And at that stage, it was not possible for us to, on um, a regular base, perform testing of all individuals in the population that had symptoms of the common cold. So we were forced, due to the fact that the shortage of testing and the shortage of personal protective equipment to perform the testing did not um, enable the hospitals to have the testing capacities in place. And we needed to make sure that this was spared so that the hospitals could have the important tools for their work. So in, in April, we were forced to go into mitigation, mitigation and do testing according to priority groups. We also had a, a form of recommendation that was directed through towards the entire population that to stay at home and isolate themselves with any type of symptoms, it could be very mild symptoms and not only fever, cough or um, fatigue. And um, uh, that was declared already in March and it was on a voluntary base, but um, we then re realized that we had to go further than just testing people with suspected uh, COVID-19. We had to direct the uh, instructions to the entire population to make sure that isolate themselves with the mildest type of symptoms. So during the spring, we established a large testing capacity and were able uh, in the beginning of June to switch back to the goal to have a full containment with large-scale testing to identify all cases. And of course, in the addition of uh, the climate uh, and the Swedish people being more outdoors, we had um, a good um, turn of the curve in May and June. And during the summer period, we had very few cases and we also did prevalence studies in the population uh, irrespective of symptoms or not. And we had very, very little ongoing transmission all the way up until September. So we had a quite long period during the summer phase where we had very few cases. In um, the, the fall, we had again a strong strike of the pandemic. And again, we had a, a focus on the densely populated areas in the country, especially in the large cities. And um, during the fall, we have 
perform large scale testing to with the goal to to contain the pandemic as far as possible. Um, we have had a strategy that uh, has looked into different aspects when implementing the measures. So the focus has not only been on the consequence of the COVID-19 infections, but also on the consequences of the measures uh, on the general public health, such as both the physical and mental health um, in this epidemiological situation, we took these uh, different aspects of the public health into consideration. So schools up until the age of 15 has in general been open throughout the pandemic. School closures has been performed and can be implemented as a consequence of local outbreaks or a high level of local transmission. Also sport activities has been encouraged throughout the pandemic, but in um, a safe manner. And uh, since you're not able to close down a country completely, you need to have services open, you need to have um, personnel working with care of the elderly, working with um, at the hospitals, working with the support of um, um, all the items you need to live. Uh, we did not see that it was possible for a complete uh, closure in relation to the situation we had. But we had a large effect on the voluntary measures that were put in place. And it is, has been a combination of voluntary and legally binding measures. And the measures has aimed to save life and to slow down the outbreak through a combination of then legislative actions, strong recommendation and guidelines, awareness rising and um, the awareness in the population on, on how transmission is ongoing has been very central. And the measures has been, have been adapted throughout the pandemic. And a number of reforms has been carried out to strengthen our health system so that the healthcare system can cope with the extraordinary challenge that the COVID-19 pandemic has posed. And a strong focus has been on protecting the elderly people and other risk groups. That has really been a top priority. Social distancing and incentives to stay at home has been the key tools. There's been ban on public gatherings and we're now in the number of eight people. And this is one of the legally binding measures. Distance education and working from home has significantly reduced movement in society. And we have done comparisons with our neighboring countries. And we have the same effect on the movement of our citizens within the country as Norway and Finland and Denmark have had. So um, supportive measures to increase the compliance has also been central from the government to make sure that you have state refunding for sickness leave already from day one, no demand for medical certificate for sickness leave, and then also several supportive measures toward private companies to uh, make sure that they can live through the pandemic. And um, we have not seen that it was possible to, um, at the stages in the spring, completely contain the pandemic. So the uh, goal has been to flatten the curve so that the uh, number of hospital beds has been enough to make sure to give good care to the population, which has been a goal that has been reached. And we have continuously um, focused on addressing the general public that together we can stop the transmission, that you should stay at home even though you only have mild symptoms. The hygiene is extremely important, work from home, at any situation, so you avoid uh, pre-symptomatic transmission and always keep distance to people outside of your household. And that is both indoors and outdoors and irrespectively of symptoms so that you can avoid uh, pre-symptomatic transmission and avoid all new contacts. And then also to test yourself if symptoms to make sure that we know how the pandemic is evolving and also to raise awareness even more in the population of the mild um, course that the infection can have. And um, also we've had a, a large focus on, on um, implementing testing strategies where testing is easy accessible for the entire population. And uh, we have implemented a, a self sampling strategy so that we will not have a large effect on uh, the healthcare pe personnel in consumption of healthcare care personnel for the testing and also to avoid consumption of personal protective equipment. And that was especially important in the beginning of the pandemic. 
So now we have large scale uh, testing facilities in place all through the country. And um, we also have um, a strong focus on adapting to the evolvement of the pandemic. And by doing so, different type of measures has been um, put in place. So I'll stop at, at that. Okay, thank you so much. I have some follow-up questions, but uh, I guess we better go um, with our round around uh, Europe and the Mediterranean. And um, we stay in Europe, and um, I want to um, um, to um, to approach to you, uh, Professor Lothar Biller, as I said, uh, um, head of the uh, president of the Robert Koch Institute in uh, in Germany. Uh, kind of the same question. Um, with you, can you expand on the strategy Germany, Germany took throughout the pandemic and share your thought about how do you view this efficiency or the efficient efficiency of this strategy in retrospect? I mean, from what we know here and, 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 sh and again, uh, for the sake of the, uh, um, for this panel to be useful, if you can just um, focus, Professor, on the distinctions between Germany and other countries. I mean, from what we know here, Yep. Germany has kept the, uh, the um, education system and the schools quite, uh, I mean, open quite longer than, for instance, here in Israel. And if you can expand on, on the strategy and, and what you think about it in retrospect. Yeah, thank you so uh, very much. Uh, it's, it's my honor and, and a pleasure here to be in this forum. And, and I have to say, uh, I would have loved to meet you in, in a better situation before already. I have strong links uh, to Israel, we have strong links to Sweden. And um, uh, during all of the time that we are running through this pandemic, we have exchanged our views all the time so that we learn from each other. So this is the first thing I have to say. Uh, uh, and this is very, very important to learn from each other. And we have done so. And, and uh, this is, this is the first lesson to learn, that we have to hook up with our ideas and exchange our ideas. And this, this is a, a, a particular um, time of solidarity where we exchange our consequences, our recipes, basically. So um, when it comes to, to the strategy, so of, of first let me also say uh, um, it's a particular pleasure here because you know that this is uh, 1,700 years of Jewish life in, in Germany. and, and uh, uh, therefore, it's also a pleasure for me to be here on the Jerusalem uh, conference. Um, the, the strategy, what was mentioned by Dr. Tekmark Wiesel, all the tools that she mentioned basically are the tools that each and every country uses. Yeah? And there's no difference. It's a difference in the strength, in uh, how, how tough you implement the tools, at what time span you implement the tools, and to what kind of uh, intensity you have tools available or not. It's about not so much the quality of tools, but uh, it's more about the capacity and the quantity of tools that you can uh, have in a particular country and that you can raise. And so when it comes to, to the um, strategy, we were on the one hand in a pretty good situation in the beginning because we had the first introduction to Germany by a Chinese woman, and we had a, 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 a nice, to say, nice outbreak that we could contain. And we could contain this outbreak because we have a pretty good national, uh, national uh, public health institution. The, the local public health institutions are very strong in Germany. So we were able to contain this outbreak. And be, we, because we had this one outbreak, we learned a lot about the virus already in our own hands. We did sound investigations genome analysis, uh, we, did, uh, we were able to calculate the transmission rate and so on and so on. So we, we learned a lot from an outbreak, we could contain it, and only four weeks later then the whole first wave started in Germany. This gave us time for good preparation. Secondly, we were among the first that had tests. And the reason is that we have uh, scientists in Germany that are very early involved in setting up the tests. And so in Germany, we have a particular structure of diverse laboratories 
which are not centralized, but diverse laboratories. Actually, there are more than 250 laboratories, and most of them are able to immediately set up PCR tests. It's a generic tool that all the tests, all the laboratories can do, and they are quality. Uh, they, are, uh, they are qualified to do it, so we could easily ramp up testing. This was something that was also very, very important to us. And, and, and thirdly, of course, we had a, a, a clear strategy. And the strategy is based on the, the fundamentals of the pandemic preparedness for influenza. It's also an airborne disease is transmitted through people, through the uh, uh, through people talking to us, speaking to each other, through aerosols, through, through droplets. And so basic principles to contain influenza also stick to this particular disease. So we had all the tools. However, and this uh, I think fits for most of us, in the beginning, we didn't have enough protective um, um, uh, um, resources for particular those who worked in, in the health system. So um, protection of those was um, a limit and we uh, tried to to uh, close this gap very early. So our strategy is based on containment, on protection and mitigation. And these three different columns of our um, strategy, we have taken all the time. There may be months when you put more effort into containment, maybe months where you put more effort in protection, depending on the situation. And to do this, you have to be able to understand what's going on. So you need a good epidemic intelligence. And having an epidemic challenge, there's on the one hand, the notification system, which is on a regular base. It's, it's a legal base where we have good uh, uh, ideas about the cases popping up and the intensity of disease. But in addition, we have various surveillance systems that gave us the chance to very early on um, have an, a clue on, on how intensive this disease would be. So we were very early, had the ability to know not only the epidemiology, of this disease, but in addition also the burden of disease. In February, we modeled already the outcome of this disease if we wouldn't be able to contain it. And so we very early on knew the burden of disease because many data were published from China that were really helpful in these times. And, 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 and thirdly, we also have a huge capacity in the health system, but we then really very soon in, in summer ice or in, in March already realized that the so-called public health system, the local health system, although it's strong, it's not strong enough. And so whenever we identified deficiencies or, or a, a lack of resources, we tried to put efforts to, to rise the capacity. So for example, we put on a, um, a program where we put 4 billion euro into rising the digital capacity and human capacity in the public health system to strengthen it. Because we strongly believe we have to bring numbers down. The most important issue here is reducing incidence because otherwise, if there's a certain level of incidence, the threshold is taken, you can't control it. You can't control it. And therefore, you have to put a lot of efforts in it. What we did also, we set up tools to measure the intensity, how many people was, uh, are staying in the intensive care units to have a level for knowing how high the burden of the health system is. And uh, we, we established various intelligent tools, mobility monitor, because mobility is a very, very good proxy for how good a lockdown actually works. And coming up to Sweden, Sweden had the same mobility reduction in, in March, basically, although they did not, uh, 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 they asked their population basically to, to, to stay at home, but we, we uh, ordered them to stay at home. In the beginning, the percentage of reduction mobility was very similar between Sweden and Germany, for example. Yeah? And um, when it, we also raised the capacity for testing. Nowadays, we can test nearly 2 million tests, do 2 million tests a week, so that we really have a good idea on what is going on in our population. Um, we put on a very effective lockdown very early on in March. And I consider this a very effective lockdown. The backside of this lockdown was that actually, although all those who are really into epidemiology and virology want that we will have a research in, in uh, autumn and winter, the, the further lockdowns were not strong enough. So to reduce the incident properly enough. Um, we put on national testing strategies 
And these were always, I think, at least 10 times they were um, um, adapted to the needs of the epidemiological situation, and they were adapted to the needs of the development of new diagnostic tests, which is also very important. So basically, we are constantly revising our, um, our recommendations. And when we talk about schools, in the beginning, we, we, we closed schools in the first lockdown, the very efficient lockdown, and then uh, we did not close schools but uh, instead, we said those schools that are open, they have to have a strong hygienic management, um, uh, managing uh, good tools to really reduce the chance of the virus to spread um, in these uh, population. Because we know that uh, uh, they are as infective as all other age groups, basically. So we have to protect them in particular. Through the fact that Germany is not that strong in digitization when it comes to school homeschooling, this we have to compromises here. But clearly, um, we 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 put more efforts on school now because on the 16th of December we put an another lockdown into effectiveness, and and this has schools also as part of the lockdown, which is very very important because of course the schools are people are in, in involved in the outbreak. So basically. Uh, one thing that I also briefly try to um, touch here is um, Germany is in the middle of Europe, so it's geographically not easy to contain an outbreak that is driven through an international uh, um, wave, of course, because we have a lot of travel going on, we're middle in the part of, of uh, Europe, so that makes that doesn't make it easy to contain such a huge outbreaks. And, um, that's that's basically what I want to say. That's that's basically what we're doing. And again, the strength uh, uh, in the beginning was our diverse laboratory network, where you have more than 250 labs that in between a week were able to do testing. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Wieler. And now I want to turn uh, to turn to um, my Israeli friend, professional friend, and um, Professor Nadav Davidovich. Um, Professor Davidovich, um, what can you say about uh, the way Israel dealt with the uh, pandemic, with the outbreak? And uh, following what, uh, what uh, the first uh, two speakers have just said, um, do you think that in retrospect, you would advise to do things differently? Advise the government to, to, uh, to take a different approach? Uh, thank you, Moav, and uh, thank you all. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, to be here on this uh, panel. Uh, I'm a public health physician and epidemiologist, but I also have a PhD in sociology. So sometimes I'm taking also uh, even an anthropological stance of uh, looking on things uh, from inside and outside. Um, I think that uh, there was, of course, no one response because we're talking about one year. And at least in the Israeli case, you cannot disconnect our response from the political situation. We had uh, uh, the third election in one year last March, and we're going to have the fourth election uh, in March. And this is not just to say, okay, it's a problematic political situation. It's extremely important because for example, in March, uh, until, sorry, until uh, May, uh, we have a provisional uh, government and uh, in some ways, maybe it's not good for democracy, but uh, it was much easier to implement even very stringent uh, measures such as a lockdown. And uh, after the strange government we had uh, was established, strange because it was a, two parties that uh, needed uh, uh, agreement on everything. And it became very, very difficult to move from uh, science to policy to decision making. Uh, so this creates lots of uh, tension. So the first uh, a wave, uh, Israel was, uh, as it presented before, in a way it was easier for us because we are a country that can close the borders relatively uh, easier, especially if you compare to Germany, of course, as uh, was presented uh, before. And Israel was uh, one of the first countries, at least uh, we are not exactly in Europe, but we belong to WHO Europe. We closed our borders. 
Uh, there were political issues, for example, we, it took some time to close the borders with the US uh, because of political uh, consideration. And then it was decided to close for every country. Uh, Moab now it sounds like uh, prehistoric times, but you remember uh, those, uh, those issues. And things then were very, very centralized, uh, very centralized on everything. Uh, the health funds, the wonderful health funds that are now doing the vaccination campaign got into the whole process very late. Uh, all the question of testing was very central. We have wonderful central virological national laboratories uh, headed by Professor Ella Mendelssohn. This was great maybe when you have, you know, like few cases, but when you started to get uh, into the stage of wide community transmission, uh, we had a crisis. Moab, you remember with testing, and it's now uh, how to remember it even because now Israel is doing a really amazing, uh, great work uh, in terms of uh, testing and we have different policies. So I think we need to differentiate between the first phase when we had the first government, uh, the minister, special, uh, minister of Health, director general of the Minister of Health, and all of them left actually when we moved to the second wave. Uh, so, because I have very short time, I'm going to leave the first wave. I think it was extremely frustrating for me. I'm dealing with pandemics for 20 years and everything we prepared was actually uh, taken away, discarded and uh, dealt in a very centralized manner and was very frustrating. What happened when uh, the second government was formed and when we started to have uh, the second wave, and you need to remember that the first wave in Israel was very, was perceived as very extremely successful, very few, relatively few deaths comparing to the world, etc. But believe me, there were very structural, lots of structural problems uh, uh, there that later became more, more evident. Uh, from uh, June, I joined uh, uh, the expert uh, committee. This was uh, established that there was a new director general, a new minister of health, a new government, and from then. Uh, I'm not sure that we are more successful, but at least things are more organized. Uh, and we have now a national program, it's called uh, Magen Israel, or Protecting uh, uh, Israel. Uh, the Minister of Health nominated Professor Oni Gamzo to be the, we call it in Hebrew, projector, is like the, the a designated person. Uh, he was a former director of the uh, General of the Minister of Health and a very known well-known figure uh, in Israel. He came as a kind of volunteering. Uh, he's an, on the everyday job, is the director of general of the very large hospital in Tel Aviv. Uh, he came and I think what was really important that he did, and it's still uh, very relevant today. And I think Moab, this is true to learn from every country. Uh, one of the problems that there were many, many scientific groups that started to advise the government, it was a chaos. And he took all the people, including those who disagree with each other and created uh, advisory boards. So I'm sitting on the policy advisory board, but there are also people sitting on uh, uh, monitoring the situation in the hospitals uh, because uh, there was a saying that, you know, one of the targets is not to have the hospital collapsing. Uh, like, and Italy was always mentioned, don't be like Italy, don't be like, like Italy. My sister lives in Italy, in Tuscany, and I grew up in Italy, so it was very hard for me to hear those things, but it was true. Um, so uh, there was a, a, a panel advising about the models, the mathematical models. Uh, I'm sure that my colleagues can tell you how crazy it was, it's still, with all people giving different models that can be extremely different for decision makers. Um, so uh, we develop our models that uh, started to talk much more about what will happen in the next week or two weeks. That is much better than to talk, you know, what will happen in, in several months. We see the dynamic. Uh, and other important things that were developed, first of all, is a standardized uh, um, database for decision making. This was extremely important in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the illness, the, the people that were infected according to uh, uh, geography, according to demography. Also, uh, there were a agreement how to 
uh, work with the R coefficient, which is also a nightmare, uh, and how it can be uh, uh, presented. And there was developed a dashboard that every morning it's being presented for decision uh, makers. Uh, so these were very important uh, uh, aspects. Um, other extremely important, uh, two other important aspects, one, and, and I'll finish soon, uh, one was finally creating a one body with the Ministry of Health and the Home Front Command to do contact tracing, because this was this became a, a nightmare before that. Uh, so the Ministry of Health was giving more the, the you know, how to frame it, and the, the manpower was many times uh, by the Home Front Command that can mobilize people and also uh, computerize the infrastructure that was also very uh, uh, important. And gradually these things improved uh, uh, dramatically. I think that our mission was not to get into a second lockdown, we failed. Our mission was not to get into a third lockdown, we failed. I um, don't think that lockdowns, I think lockdown is only when you don't have any other options and sometimes you get into it. Uh, and also the question how you get out of a lockdown and unfortunately Israel, because of political pressure, because we have different groups, and I think the previous presenters, I, I really love them to speak a bit about uh, health inequalities in their countries because this is a major issue. So in Israel, we have the ultra-Orthodox community, the Arab community, and our main plan was called the traffic light system and it's a differentiated measure. And this was the political nightmare to get it approved and until it was approved, uh, we had already extremely wide community transition a transmission that it was not relevant uh, anymore. I truly believe in the traffic light system. It's not just about, and it's very important, and here I finish, that you, do, you cannot uh, deal just with a number of corona. There are things that are not corona and you need to see how to deal with them. There are the mental health issues, uh, corona fatigue, all, all of that. And this is of course related to the economy. And I think here we did, we could do better probably. Uh, we have question about education and we try to develop different hybrid system and we also wanted to develop a protective education system with a, a pooling and testing and uh, it's still uh, entering the third wave. Uh, it was not so successful because of uh, compliance. And of course, now we're entering into the vaccination phase. It's not something different. And my big frustration, and we're doing a webinar in a week and a half, uh, Moav, it's about culture. I think it's... Uh, uh, I don't know, we say in Hebrew like to data newt, like a poverty paper, <laughs> that uh, we put our culture very, very far. And I think that uh, we were working specifically on models, how to have culture, you know, uh, maybe outside, maybe using a, a fast uh, testing, etc., antigen testing. It's, it's a very a complicated uh, thing that we are trying to deal with right now, but I think all of us need to think also about this part, about art and culture, because it's part of public health. That, that's my belief. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Nadav. Um, I want to do another round with the more specific um, uh, questions. Um, I want to uh, share the screen um, of the... Um, uh, you know, the world data meter. And, and here we can see the uh, confirmed, uh, cumulative confirmed death by the COVID-19 per million people from the yeah. first of the outbreak until today. Um, and I took, uh, you know, uh, Sweden, Germany, Israel, and then I took Finland and Norway as an equivalent, so maybe a point of reference to uh, Scandinavian. And um, Dr. Wiesel, I want to ask you uh, to address this uh, notion, uh, the perception, at least in some parts um, of the uh, public, is that Sweden took an, 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 an kind of a very, uh, um, very intention driven uh, policy or decision, thinking or, or arguing that the lockdowns are not going to, uh, uh, to, to, um, to win or to defeat the outbreak. They're just going to uh, delay it. 
And therefore, there is no logic in closing the country because it will, it will struggle and strangle the, uh, the economy. But then when you see this uh, diagram, you can see that in terms of uh, deaths per million people, uh, the numbers in, in, in Sweden are much higher than Germany and Israel and, and, and uh, much, much higher than in Finland and Norway. So I want to ask you, in retrospect, do you see this number as a reflection of the strategy you took, often, you know, as some kind of a, a thing that was um, an external force, I would say, something that um, there was not much to be done in order to, to change this diagram? And do you think that in retrospect, you would have done things differently? So did you address the question to uh, Dr. Wieler or? Yeah, to Dr. Yes, Wieser. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, to Wiesel or Wiesel. <laughs> exactly, but I, I think Wiesel. I also have to answer it later. Wiesel. Okay. The, the, I <laughs> talked about Sweden. Yes, then we can you. go to Wieler. Yes, okay. So, um, of course- I mean, I mean two, two epidemiologists from different countries and you had this, the, 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 you know, kind of the same a family named Yes, so well, complicated likely, measures. Yeah. Yes. Sounds, sounds so similar. No, I'm joking, yes. Yes, okay. So, of course, we are very concerned about the high death toll that has um, been in Sweden. And um, looking at the number, this is looking at the confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million people. And um, then you also need to look how do you measure and how do you report deaths. And I... Um, think that Germany and Sweden have rather similar ways of measuring deaths. So we report any case that uh, are um, dying within 30 days of the diagnose, the laboratory diagnose of um, COVID-19, irrespectively of the cause of death. Uh, so also people that has a, another cause of death will be reported in the system, in the system if they have the diagnose within 30 days. Uh, so that is uh, the way Sweden reports its deaths, which makes us come up quite high in many reporting systems, but there are other countries that report the same way. Uh, and when we look at the death toll, it is very skewed towards the elderly population and more than 50% of the death has occurred in the elderly homes. Um, and um, less than 1% of the deaths are in the population below 50 years of age. And I think many countries have similar pictures of how the demographics look in the, in the death toll. Uh, but of course, we are very disappointed in the high number of deaths. We had a high priority to protect the elderly, and it has been the elderly that has been um, taken the large um, uh, part in the death toll. Um, this is... Um, also looking into various different factors why the death toll is as high as it is and I think we cannot fully evaluate the reasons for this yet but um, we, we do believe that the uh, lockdown um, measures of course are one important uh, aspect on the community transmission and the community transmission uh, in turn has an effect on the reach out to the elderly population um, but other aspects also need to be taken into consideration, uh, such as the level of uh, transmission when we were first struck by the pandemic in the spring of 2020, and also um, the, the workup of the elderly care. How is the elderly care being performed and how many people are living in elderly care and how is the... Um, structure of the population looking because you will have if you have a large part of, of elderly in your country you have will have a larger death toll so i think there are many uh, ways you need to look at these numbers more than just comparing the figures as such but of course we've had we've been struck very hard by the pandemic and um, we had a large effect on the voluntary measures when it comes to mobilization for one um, but we had also a, a huge uh, transmission ongoing in the elderly homes, which was really resulting in, in a poor outcome. I, I, I guess I'm trying to ask whether you agree that you in Sweden took a different approach 
and I'm not being judgmental. I'm asking whether you agree that it was a different approach, yeah, less, less strict lockdowns because it doesn't help to, to defeat the, 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 the outbreak, it just delayed. And if it retro retrospect, you think it was the right approach and you will even recommend in the, in, for I other think, countries to, I to think embrace they, such approach to better even, fight the pandemic. This is my question. And yes. I'm not being judgmental, I'm trying to, to understand so your, your, your way of your yes, way of I think we would have tried to, um, of course we would have had, um, in retrospect, we would um, wish to have had a higher test capacity than we had uh, in the early stages in March, even though we did implement a high uh, test capacity later, so we really could reach out to identify more cases uh, early on. Uh, the other thing is that when we look at the different regions, it looks very, very different when you're looking at the death toll. So we have regions that has no excess mortality because we look at a lot at the excess mortality numbers to really incorporate the entire epidemic. Uh, and several of our regions has no excess mortality, but when we look at the large regions like the Stockholm region had a, an excess mortality in the spring. And now the excess mortality is not very high in the Stockholm region, but it is high in the Southern parts of Sweden. So looking back, we would have directed more regional efforts, but, but we still need to, to assess and um, evaluate over and over again to see what can be done differently for the future. Okay, um, so according to the, um, to the original plan, I would uh, go over now to Mr. Professor Wieler and then to Professor Davidovich, but I've been told uh, Dr. Uh, Wiesel that you had to, um, to leave in a few minutes. So I would like to take the opportunity and, and uh, present you with the, uh, with the last question uh, with the permission of the two, the two other gentlemen and then, and then we will um, keep on with them. Um, I want uh, to ask you about uh, looking at the near future. How do you view the, uh, the uh, situation and the policy needed to be taken in Sweden now regarding the vaccination efforts and regarding uh, the situation in which um, um, it, it's, it's not going to be soon before um, a large portion of the population will be vaccinated. And then what should be the policy you think um, that should be done now, given that you know the British mutations and other very high infected mutations are still around. Yes, yeah, so the, the vaccination is rolling out now according to the European plan where we have deliveries of new vaccine coming in every week. And we prioritize uh, as the top priority are the elderly in the elderly care homes and also elderly receiving care in their homes. And we, be, we strongly believe that if we vaccinate the vulnerable population, that will um, make us a better outcome when it comes to the death toll. But then we also need to limit transmission because you have um, effects uh, throughout the entire population that are unwanted with a lot of people having long-term effects of the COVID-19 infection. And um, for that, we have an approach where we will work and try to motivate the population to be vaccinated. And we have a history of a high compliance to our vaccination program with um, more than 90 to 70% of all the children participating in the vaccination program on a voluntary basis. And we also had a very high uh, compliance when we had the vaccination program being rolled out uh, in the swine flu, flu situation. So we work now with uh, trying to have um, a transparency regarding the, uh, the type of vaccines and the side effects and the long-term potential side effects. And uh, we believe that um, a rapid rollout is important, but also we fully support the European Union um, decision-making in making sure that all the documents are, um, have been gone through in a timely manner and not too, too, too rapidly roll out vaccines, which might affect the um, compliance of the population in the long-term run. So a, a controlled rollout targeting the most vulnerable population, but then also to have um, a good compliance in the entire population to build trust in the vaccinations. That is really the key factor for the future that we believe strongly in. And in parallel, of course, follow the, um, 
the continuous transmission of the pandemic, both microbiologically and also look into the different groups in the population. Because what has also been very striking is that it is the um, certain groups in the population that has been struck much harder than other groups in the population. And I mentioned there were huge differences between the death toll and also the transmission rate in the various regions. And this uh, probably com compares very well to the um, uh, various groups uh, living and the social um, determinants in the various regions. So we see a big difference in the various groups. So for the long run and from the long future, we really need to work with equity in health and to have um, possibilities for all the people in society to have the same uh, way to protect themselves from this disease. And of course, you need to work with equity in the whole society to reach that. So that is really what this uh, pandemic has pointed at, that if you have inequities, you have different conditions in society. Some people can keep distance. Other people live maybe five to 10 people in a very uh, closed environment. It makes it very hard for them to protect themselves. And this is one of the differences we have between the Nordic countries, for instance, that we have a lot more people living close together. So we need to address those more um, societal aspects as well when we look into how can we prepare for a, a new pandemic in the future. But for this pandemic to follow closely the uh, microbiology to increase the whole genome sequencing and we are rolling out uh, a more um, thorough whole genome sequencing program that was also uh, being planned as the vaccination programs are being in, um, enforced. And um, in parallel then with the new mutant variants, we need to, to do this faster than what was planned. So right now we are looking into um, to make sure that all the regions have a good sequencing facility so we can look at the different variants and identify the critical mutations. So we continuously need to work with the uh, large scale testing to make sure that we know what is going around and also um, if we have breakthroughs through the vaccination program. And that would also be important for the, pu the, the public to know what are the effects on the transmission rate and not only what are the effects on, on the disease outcome and the death outcome. So keep on um, large scale testing, uh, ramp up the sequencing and to work with, to have a trustworthy vaccination program is the short run um, strategy. And also of course, to, to work with measures when they are needed. But our hope is with um, the vaccinations being rolled out, we can again, go back to a more normal life, but probably not within this year fully. Okay. Um, I wish to really thank you, Dr. Karin Tegmark Wiesel. Um, Thank you for this uh, fascinating uh, um, presentation and your candid uh, uh, answers to our um, questions. Um, I hope to meet you soon. And I hope for everyone, including you in Sweden, to uh, overcome this pandemic as soon as possible and in the best uh, healthy way possible. Thank you very much. And I would very much have liked to stay on in, in the seminar and uh, continuously have learned from uh, the colleagues in uh, both Germany and Israel and um, to take questions from the panel and um, apologies for not being able to stay on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And to all of you, best wishes. Thank you. Um, I want to, um, to turn to you, uh, Professor Wieler. And uh, I, have a, I have a scoop here. I managed to put uh, my hand on a documentation of the Israeli policy to fight the coronavirus pandemic. Here it comes. I hope you are all um, ready. Um, there you go. This is the Israeli policy in fighting the coronavirus pandemic. I'm protesting. <laughs> But, you, but um, you're right, Moab. This is what happened, actually. This is what exactly we wanted to avoid. But you're, you're right. Yeah, it's very frustrating. And, and the thing is that I'm not talking about it as a uh, kind of accident that happened. But, um, but 
actually, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said uh, that this is a story. We are in an accordion kind of uh, situation when uh, when the um, when the uh, number of new cases are spiking up, we have to close the uh, we have to close the uh, we have to close the uh, you know the uh, the education and the uh, economic system, and then we can uh, bring it uh, bring it back and, and open the accordion. And and my question to you, uh, Professor Wheeler, is uh, again in retrospect. In retrospect, and I'm not being judgmental because, as I said in the beginning, it, we were all in an uncharted waters, right? No one could could guess what 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 it's going to be like. But in retrospect, do you think that, for instance, opening the school system, uh, we, we, you would have done differently in order to fight the pandemic better way? Uh, you should have imposed a lockdowns earlier, or the other round. Maybe you know it. It doesn't really matter, right? You yep. put a lockdown. <laughs> You, you strangle the economy and you get to the same outcome because uh, you, you only delayed the, the, the next uh, spike in, in cases for a few weeks. So I want to ask you in retrospect, what you would have written in the history, in the, in the history books about what, what have you have might have been advised to do differently. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I really very much appreciate the frankness of, of uh, Israel people. And, and again, it's today showing off uh, uh, fantastically. So um, what, what can I say? So uh, in retrospect, or, or, or let's take it another way, as far as we don't have immunity in the country, in the population, and as, as long as we don't have immunity, as long as we don't have treatment against this virus, we have no chance but lockdown. There is no chance but physical distancing, yeah? There's no other chance. Physical distancing, protection by mass and physical distancing. That is the only way we will be able to control the spread of this virus. So this, having this in mind, this is something, this is basically fundamental for my understanding. And this is my absolute, I'm absolutely convinced because this virus transmits so easily that you otherwise don't have a chance to control it. And if you don't control it, it overrules your health system. And here we're not talking only about death, which I'm, I have to say, I'm absolutely frustrated about the death rate in Germany since the last uh, four weeks. Yeah. By, the way, today, the, by the way, today, weeks. the first day after a couple of days that again, the death rate per day um, surpassed 1,000. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a tragedy. But I can comp I I have my thoughts about this. But again, so having said this, lockdown is we we call it lockdown, whatever we call it, reducing contacts. Yeah, however you do it, this is the only way to control the pandemic. And if you have immunity or treatment and immunity, we will only have through vaccination. So, um, and this is very clear, and everybody has to understand this because we can't control the virus without immunity or physical distancing. So in retrospect, I would have liked to see a stronger lockdown in November. This is absolutely agreed upon in Germany. There are, uh, not, not in all over Germany, but I think most of the scientists that really are into this would say, oh, we should have done an, a tougher lockdown because this would have given us a chance to reduce the numbers more. Uh, profoundly, and I'm, I'm very convinced of this. Secondly, regarding schools, um, I, I and, and, and I'm also a public health person, of course. Yeah, I'm looking at from from the health equality and from the educational side, from sociology. This is, you know, we have 70 different uh, professionals in our institution, from economy, from statistics from psychology, from medicine. And we're talking about this every single day. Huh? Clearly, uh, the education and the economy are two sides of the same coin, but health is part of this coin. So anyway, so without good economy, you don't have good health, but without good health, you also ruin your economy because people wouldn't go to work if they are fearing to get infected. Yeah, I have to, to make this clear. So what we didn't, but we did not do properly. We didn't protect schools enough. So there was, we have a federal system in Germany, 16 federal states, 
and they performed differently on this uh, issue. And some schools were opened without any protection and others were opened with any with protection. So I would have loved to see only schools open with a sound con concept of hygiene measures and homeschooling. Yeah, and this we were not able to really deliver in each and every school. I don't know how many schools it were able to deliver, but I, at least I know that many schools didn't deliver properly. So you can open schools, but only if you really manage them properly. And this is doable by technology, by education, and so on. That's a matter of resources and organization. It's tough, yeah, but you can do it. At least you can't do it 100%, but you can do it better. Um, let, me, let, let me see if I get you correctly, Professor Wheeler. You said that you would have, in retrospect, would have advice for a, I mean, for a general lockdown to be linger on um, and more. But in terms of school, you say that uh, you would advise to keep the, the schools open, but in, in, in higher or strictly measures than it has been um, you know, operated. You're yep. not advising to close the schools, but you can, you can say we can keep the, the school system running, but we, we would have made, we should have made sure that it's running under very strict, uh, you know, uh, physical uh, measures. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And regarding the death rate, it's, it's very tragic in Germany, I have to say. And it's, you know, in Germany, of course, as in all other countries, we have a, the demography of Germany, we have a lot of old people. More than 3.5 million are older than 80, I think. And uh, these are the most vulnerable, as we all know. And, and of those, roughly eight, 900,000 are living in care homes. And we are not able to protect them. Most, many, many deaths appear in this care home. So again, a very similar issue here. You can protect care homes, but you have to do it, of course. Yeah, you can protect them by good testing, by good hygiene com uh, uh, concepts. And I, I don't know the numbers of this, but obviously many of these homes are not able to protect them properly. And this is tragic and it's unacceptable to make it very clear here. Yeah? And, and whoever, uh, whatever the reason is, many could have been protected better. I'm absolutely convinced. But again, saying this, this does not argue against the lockdown. Yeah? Whether you have a lockdown or not, you still have to protect people in school, the pupils, and you also have to protect people in care homes. So the protection anyway has to run all the time, regardless of a lockdown or not. And of course, the higher the numbers are, the incidents, the harder it is to protect. And this is why the, 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 the most important issue here is bringing down the numbers and incidents because infection pressure on the whole society is obviously rising when numbers are rising. And when you have community transmission, you are in trouble because the most important issue here is contact tracing and breaking outbreaks, which we were very, very, very successful in the beginning. We could control it. And I had many telephone video conferences with all people all over the world. And, and most of them absolutely are convinced that contact tracing is the, the, the most efficient way of reducing numbers and putting people into quarantine so that they can't infect any other people and putting people that are infected in isolation so that they can't infect other people. But if you lose control, you don't find those early enough and then your containment measures are simply not working properly. So therefore, the currently the only way to bring this down is a lockdown. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Willer. Um, Professor Nadav Davidovich, um, there is a, a very high level of interest in, um, in the vaccination operation in Israel, I mean, from around the world. And what can you say about, um, first of all, the reason that, um, that um, um, the, the companies like Pfizer decided to provide Israel with such a high amount of uh, vaccination? Um, even before Western European countries? 
And what is the reason that the operational aspect of uh, vaccinate the population is being uh, carried out here in Israel in a very efficient way, um, relatively, of course. So we just sent a paper for Lancet. We're waiting for uh, <laughs> their uh, review. Um, First of all, I need to say that I wish that all uh, parts of uh, Israeli response were like the vaccination campaign. That, of course, had also some problems that uh, I mentioned. But before answering uh, Moab, I need to say something. Um, I totally agree with Professor Vila. Um, I just think, and I, I probably he will agree, that uh, probably without vaccine and, and other measures, uh, we are kind of destined to lockdowns. Uh, we are against the uh, natural herd immunity idea. This is a dangerous uh, idea. By the way, many times promoted by anti-vaxxers. So it's interesting. They are willing to get herd immunity in a natural way, but not with vaccines. So this is really, I think, even uh, some strange approach. Um, and maybe this was your question. And I don't think this was true about the Swedish model. I think it was a misinterpretation by Many. I don't think they really wanted to get. Uh, maybe, maybe some at the beginning UK raised it, but now it's quite uh, very accepted that this is a bad way. So you need to get there by uh, vaccination. Now, with vaccination, we also have a, a problem because uh, it's still not approved for children. And children, for example, in Israel are thirty percent of the population. So until we won't get uh, you know, vaccination for children, and I hope the phase three of Pfizer will get there, uh, it will be very hard to get into, I, I prefer to say population immunity, not herd immunity, because it's from veterinary, you know, we are not herds. Um, now, why Israel is so uh, uh, successful? I think that uh, one, um, we are a country that uh, vaccination are really embedded in our culture, in mother and child health care centers, drop of milk centers. Um, we have a very strong community healthcare system with a national health insurance law, with a four nonprofit health funds that are distributed all over the, the country. Israel had a lot of preparation with uh, logistics and also discussion with uh, the pharmaceutical companies that we have very strong personal uh, uh, relationship. Just to mention Moderna, for example, I'm very proud to say that the chief medical officer is a graduate of Ben Gurion University Medical School, uh, Professor Tal Zaks. And this, of course, also helped. But uh, yeah, I probably think that, uh, you know, having a relatively small country with 9 million people, with uh, very good uh, computerized medical records, uh, with very good, uh, um, you know, record of doing uh, vaccination research. We, we had in the past uh, many of them and you know to do the phase four and this is not an experiment it's also a mistake it's it's a post-marketing surveillance right uh, that Israel is doing now like any other country and I think it's unethical uh, not to give it to other countries to the WHO and to Pfizer because people were raising uh, Professor Villa that maybe we are selling it or something like that this is not true I think we are responsible like Germany like other countries to give uh, the data about adverse events about, and I'm very proud to say that uh, according to Clalit Health Services research, uh, I got my, my second vaccine just uh, two days ago. I, I feel okay, I don't have a tail uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, so uh, we know from Clalit that after one vaccine, uh, two weeks later, uh, there was already a reduction in transmission of uh, 33%. And this is something uh, that is going to be published probably soon. And uh, the Clalit Health Services are going to continue this study. We are also doing a similar study in the elderly homes because anyway, uh, we are doing a special program of uh, not only vaccinating them, but uh, having every week uh, testing all of them. So we, we can get all the data also about transmission. So this will be very, really uh, interesting. Professor Villa will be happy to share the, the data. Of, of course, I know it's very interesting for you as well, but it, it looks it looks promising. Uh, but but uh, if you take all of this together, Moab, and also the fact that Israel is in a constant state of emergency, unfortunately, unfortunately, 
And we had the drills called Orange Flames for the last decade of uh, uh, biological threats. Uh, so all of this together with the uh, wonderful uh, community healthcare, uh, the logistics, uh, the computerized medical records, the collaboration with uh, Pfizer that know that we can be like a model country, I think all together, but also fighting fake news. We invested lots of time uh, to go on webinars like now, um, to uh, do surveillance of uh, social media against fake news and, and report a, a Facebook. Um, and be in dialogue also with people that are hesitant. Most people in Israel are not anti-vaxxer. They're hesitant. I totally understand it. It's a new vaccine. You need to explain that it's not a new technology. It's already 10 years around, uh, that uh, everything was done according to the book. And then you get a, a better a, um, compliance rates. But, and now I'll do the criticism. And Professor Vilo right, the Israelis are open. Uh, so I have criticism, yes. Uh, I think we need to vaccinate also, to, uh, we are responsible to vaccinate also the Palestinian Authority to give them vaccines. And we are in, it's not just for moral reasons, it's also from epidemiological reasons because we are almost like a one epidemiological uh, uh, unit. And there are issues, Moab, you know, about uh, uh, prisoners and it was delayed and the, the Minister of Health ordered to do so and I don't know why it's not happening yet. Uh, and also in the periphery and the so low socioeconomic groups, we saw that uh, rates are going up at not the same pace like in the in the center of, of, of Israel. And again, this is something that the Minister of Health is aware and there are lots of uh, efforts uh, to do so. I just want to say finally about vaccination that uh, I'm very, very frustrated. And I think that all of us should fight the idea of vaccine nationalism. This is creating lots of problems. Uh, all these uh, secret agreements uh, between countries to uh, Pfizer or Moderna, this is a very bad situation. We need to go all the world together because if we want to get herd immunity or, or population immunity, um, we must take into consideration uh, all the world because otherwise, if you want to get flights back and, and our life back, uh, we need to deal with it. I'm very happy that uh, WHO are doing the COVAX initiative, but this is not enough. I, we need to rethink the pharmaceutical company approach and we need to do it together. And especially for vaccination, let's leave aside for now. I think it's true for all other pharmaceutical, but for public health emergencies, uh, uh, for sure, because we have now market failures um, because of the really in bad initiatives, because finally Pfizer is a for-profit company. I think they're doing a great uh, job, but uh, this is something that uh, need to be taken care of on the global uh, level. Uh, I think that finally, Moab, I hope that we won't be, uh, how you say accordion in English? I, I don't accordion. know. Accordion. Uh, in the expert committee, we were against it. Not because we don't think that sometimes we need to get into lockdowns, but we need to be much more gradual. You know, people are not heard that you can press a button, you know, now lockdown, now out of lockdown. Uh, you need to have all the economic support and here Germany is doing an amazing job with the economic support. And as Professor Villa said, it's part of public health. And I know at the uh, Robert Koch Institute are also economists and this is so important. Um, so we need to think already about uh, some exit strategies. Uh, we won't get into population immunity for many uh, months, but we need to see how to return art and culture in the more sophisticated way than just, just lockdowns or vaccination also, uh, rapid testing and other tools. Uh, and we need to see how we are going to learn from uh, COVID-19. It was a mirror to represent our failures in society. Uh, how we need to strengthen the public system, the healthcare system, how we need to strengthen uh, the education system uh, and uh, how we need, we didn't spoke about it, how we need to rethink urban uh, health uh, and uh, uh, urban planning. And, and maybe if we take the lessons, uh, you know, we can get into something that is much better. I know that maybe I'm answering already your third uh, question that we discussed oh, okay. about, about the future, yeah. but yeah. This, is, this is the future. If you're going, okay, we are going to get out of COVID-19, I promise all of us. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to have uh, many other uh, um, uh, challenges, uh, including uh, other uh, pandemics or outbreaks. 
but maybe more important, climate change. I think I'm much more afraid of climate change. I'm much more afraid that uh, uh, how we are going to deal all countries together with uh, climate change because climate change is going to influence our health on many different ways with migration, uh, refugees and, and the infectious diseases and many other uh, things. And this is why we need all in a solidarity to fight it together within our countries and between our countries. I just want to, um, um, to say, Nadav, that uh, if the uh, policy of uh, the vaccination was to share equally between uh, the countries, Israel would not have been in the stage where we are now with, you know, roughly, uh, roughly, uh, why not? Because all the vaccination uh, developments, you know, you could uh, have a joint venture having not like a 100 something different uh, companies trying to develop vaccines, but taking the, let's say the four or five main approaches, develop together, testing them, uh, 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 you know, to placebo, things will be much more efficient. And, and then uh, I know it sounds very strange, the idea of collaboration in a neoliberal world, in a capitalistic world, but uh, I'm, telling you, uh, during the times when 80% of uh, investment in uh, pharmaceuticals was public, and this is after World War II, this was the most uh, uh, flourishing and innovative time. And in recent years, of course we have innovations, but when the pharmaceutical companies are taking, uh, I don't know, 60, 70% of the budget for marketing, and uh, many times are not so invested in innovations, but are invested to make money. And uh, again, I'm not talking, you know, pharmaceutical companies are not a monolithic entity. There are wonderful people there. They are, uh, you know, investing all their lives into research. But, you know, even take uh, uh, Pfizer. This was a, a German, a Professor Villa. It, it was a German uh, public uh, investment in the, in the research of messenger RNA that was adapted by, uh, you know, a private uh, company. So sometimes we, we forget that the, the, the researchers in the public institution, and, and here Germany probably is, an, is a good example uh, for, for the world, um, we need to change, our, especially for emergencies, we need to change the way we're dealing with things. And again, climate change, I think is one of the main uh, you know, challenges and how we're going to deal with it. So vaccine nationalism, Rand uh, uh, wrote a report that this is going to cost the world totally more than one trillion dollar because it's not efficient that all the system now and also the secrecy. Moab, it's created lots of conspiracy theories in Israel. Everything is so secret. I myself signed a secret a secret uh, agreement that I cannot uh, tell anything about this and that. And I can tell I you as a journalist. Details. I can tell you as a journalist covered the situation that when I'm trying to uh, get information about uh, how many vaccines uh, are Israel going to get next week or next month, and they don't tell you nothing, they tell you nothing. So the reason I ask why, why it's so secret, I mean, you know, and they say, uh, because the pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer said that if it will be out, uh, out in the public, then they will have a tremendous pressure from other countries saying, why are you sending Israel 10 million doses before you sell us 1 million? And you know, they have their different kind of interests because Israel is like an island and they can use, Israel is very attractive to the pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer because they can do a testing in, some, in, in a real life environment. It's an experiment in a real life world, in a real world a kind of a, a circumstances. So this is the answer I get. Um, I don't know if it's a, if if this is if this is a correct answer, but this is the answer I get. Um, we have like uh, three, four more minutes left. I want to uh, turn to you, uh, Professor Wheeler. Um, I have many questions, so <laughs> pick up the most interesting one for you. <laughs> um, first of all, in terms of the vaccination, um, do you think that the EU approach of purchasing the vaccines? is a good approach or do you think it should have done be done differently and the second question i wonder what would you the experts uh, would advise about the situation with the children because children under the age of 18 or under 16 
are not going to have uh, um, useful vaccines approved in the, in, the, in the near future. It will take months and months. So when, you, let's say 60% of the population will be vaccinated, would you advise for the government to treat this, the, the everyday life as if children are immune and to go back to open school as usual as before the pandemic? Or, because some experts say, look, okay, children are not being uh, affected or um, developing symptoms like elder people. They can be infected and not get it, you know, as a, as a very, very uh, um, strong disease. But yet, if you're going with large numbers, children might be dead because every children in the country will be with coronavirus. So I wonder what would be your epidemiologic approach to this situation when the population is vaccinated, but the children are not. Yeah, very, very um, important question. Um, not easy to answer right now, to be honest, but I, I share my thoughts with you. So, so first of all, I have to clarify um, about the schools. So the Robert Koch Institute always recommended for protection and hygiene concepts, but these, recommend, these recommendations were not taken by all different stakeholders, okay? So we always recommended this, not there's, that there's some misunderstanding. So um, the, the question, um, so again, what was your first question? I forgot about it. The Forget first... it, let's go to the second. <laughs> it's more interesting. The, se the second question. Uh, the, the, about the children thing, yeah. about the children so, issue, the dilemma. So, so clearly what will happen, um, uh, you are absolutely right. This is a, a, a situation I know for, first of all, I know that there are studies uh, running already that are um, uh, testing the efficacy of, of vaccines in children. They are currently running, but I have no idea how long it takes and, and uh, I have no sense on this. So basically, we, we for moment, momentarily, we are not, uh, uh, nobody wants to, to vaccinate children. It's not part of the, of the strategy that we currently have. So what will happen is, the more, um, uh, so, so, and we don't currently know how much, and this is therefore I'm very much interested in, in your data, uh, Dr. Davidovich. Uh, we are, we're not really knowing how much the, the um, shedding of viruses is reduced by immunization. We, 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 at least I have, I don't simply don't know it. And uh, this is very much um, part of the answer. The more virus shedding is reduced, the better, of course, it is, and the less pressure then is on, on children. Um, on the other hand, um, we will have reached a certain, um, I, 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 I now don't have the numbers, but a certain number of children will have gone through this infection until the rest of the population has been vaccinated. And hopefully, hopefully most of these children won't have long-lasting COVID uh, problems, which we are not foreseeing so, so far so much. So basically, I, I, um, I hope that we can prevent infection of children by still um, um, having particular tools that keep the virus out of schools and out of children as much as possible. I have to say, we will have to take care of children for a longer time then we will have take, to take care of, of adults that have been vaccinated. This is the, the, the question to children. The first question again was? Um, it was about the policy of purchasing vaccines by the EU. Oh, yeah, the, no, I mean, absolutely, I'm absolutely, uh, I'm really glad that, uh, that the European Union uh, put together the strength and the, 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 um, the will to buy vaccines together, yeah? It would have, been, would have been even better if the whole world would have done this treaty, which is not possible, of course. But I'm absolutely convinced that uh, vaccination is a purely solidaric act, and not only for a society, but for the whole world. And therefore, uh, the more we share, the more we share um, and, and give back our own interest uh, and share our interests with other countries, the better it is for the whole world. Vaccination is a, a, absolutely an act of solidarity and we have to make it as solidary 
as possible. Okay, um, we are running out of time, but uh, I want to present you with last question uh, from uh, a distinguished guest in, uh, in the audience. And I wish to ask you um, to answer um, briefly because we are out of time. So the question is that um, in the, in the, in the uh, 2019, right? Um, one year before the pandemic outbreak, uh, the Global Health Security Index ranked the USA as first in health security. And most countries have proven to be unprepared for this threat that uh, has been predicted for years. And the question is, are we measuring the right things when it comes to pandemic uh, preparedness? And what will your governments do to lead the way for better global preparedness in the future? So as uh, I, I have to jump off now. So let me briefly answer. I, I have to my next appointment. Um, it's true. Obviously, we are not measuring all the right uh, indicators. That's a fact. And so um, something that we did not look enough into, for example, is governance. Yeah, very important. It's not about resources only. The, the, the problem here is that we measure too much resources, but not the governance and not the management of resources and how you deal with resources. So, and I think this is something where, um, in, in general, at least in principle, the Israel is very good when it comes to operative measures here. Clearly, you are a very resilient country. And uh, I mean, you live in certain circumstances that we all know about. And so basically, it is wrong to measure resources only, but it is very, very important to measure the, how operative you can use these resources. And good governance is key. If there's not a good governance and there's no trust into, for example, the government, you are in trouble. For, for, for absolutely, I'm absolutely convinced about this. So I don't know the indicators for this, whether we have proxies for this, but this should be um, part of the, uh, um, of the way we, we uh, rank countries when it comes to certain abilities. And with this, I have to leave, yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you, but I just want to say that I, I totally agree with your comments. I would just add also the question of health uh, inequities. Yeah. Uh, as, in, as indicator, and also taking uh, the U.S. with a fragmented, mainly private system, I think it's uh, just a proof that uh, this kind of system are horrible in uh, answering uh, any <laughs> public health uh, uh, threat. Of course, they have wonderful, they have the CDC, they have many wonderful things, and also they had the political uh, issue of a uh, very tiered apart society. I mean, you need a social, you need a good, a good social system. And in Germany, we have a, a strong social system since 150 years. And this proved to be really helpful. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you so and, much, and Professor stay Villar. Healthy. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor Villar. Um, Nadav, uh, really, a few words uh, to wrap up uh, from you about the, um, about the issue with children that I think that, uh, is going, that, that we are going to face in the near future, especially in Israel, when in, in two months from now, maybe 60, 70% of the population will be vaccinated, but uh, children will uh, remain without a vaccine. So as I said, uh, there is no one answer to the uh, pandemic and vaccination are not the whole answer. And lockdown, of course, are not the whole answer. So we need to look for a pooling and, and the more sophisticated way of uh, doing, uh, you know, testing, different kind of testing, the protective education uh, project, uh, teaching outside uh, and the uh, hybrid uh, ways. And uh, finally, this is something that must be planned ahead because you remember Moab that uh, many times the Minister of Health and Minister of Education are not talking to each other so much when planning. So I think uh, I would finish with the magic word of uh, integration. Sometimes we call it health in all policies. So public health is not just about counting uh, COVID cases. Uh, it's also about integration and uh, having a much more sophisticated approach than just lockdowns or just vaccination. And vaccination are go going to solve our problems of the 
you know, the, the investment in the healthcare system and in the educational system. So we will need to be much more um, proactive and opening at the school. I think about the more the, that finally there was a change in uh, September, uh, if you compare it to June about the role of education, it became much more higher priority even when we entered the lockdown. When we're going to reduce uh, the numbers, it's much easier to control uh, schools with uh, testing and pooling. Right now it's very hard because uh, it's widespread. So without entering to the discussion, you know, what is the role of education in infecting? Uh, when you have wide community transmission, it's very hard to keep the schools uh, open. Uh, but I think that uh, one of my first priorities to have them uh, open, even if the, we don't have the vaccines uh, yet and we have the tools to do it. Okay. Professor Davidovich, thank you so much uh, for the uh, fascinating and eye-opening uh, thing that you said today. Um, and also I wish to thank the Professor Willer and uh, Dr. Wiesler uh, that took part in this uh, discussion. I really hope um, that uh, it helps us all um, not, uh, not only to hear a different perspective, but to educate ourselves in the way we uh, perceived and, uh, and uh, you know, trying to um, deal with this uh, coronavirus and the challenges it brings uh, to all of us. Uh, I wish to thank you, Professor Davidovich, and I want to hand the microphone, the virtual microphone, to uh, Uri Dromi for some final words. Thank you. I want to thank you, Moab, for uh, moderating it uh, so prof professionally. I want to thank uh, Dr. Karin Tegmart Wiesel from Sweden, Professor Lothar Wieler from uh, Germany, Professor Nadav Davidovich from Israel, uh, my colleagues uh, Talia Dekel and Rachel Exil, and of course uh, the German ambassador to Israel, Dr. Susanne Wassum Reiner, and His Excellency. Uh, the Swedish ambassador to Israel, Mr. Erik uh, Ullenhog uh, and his staff. Thank you all. I know that there are some questions which remained unanswered. So be in touch with us. We try to uh, forward those questions to the panelists and get back to you with the answer. Thank you all for being with us. And uh, it's a pilot. So we might think about doing a uh, something of the sort with other countries. I think it's very illuminating and, and, and a learning experience to learn from the experience of others. Thank you all for being with us uh, and goodbye. We hope you enjoyed that briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. If you did, like the video and hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our future content.